studio. Remember the scene in The Wizard of Oz where they finally reveal him behind the curtain and he says, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain? Well, this is what goes on in the back room at the Art of Fire. Good morning, Josh. Morning, morning, Bruce. <laughs> I'm oh, Bruce really Ferguson, you. and uh, this is Josh Reese. Josh is going to demonstrate for us today what you're going to make. Well, I figured it'd be cool to kind of show you guys how we get set up, because we really don't show that. So come on back. Let's take a look at the colors. So here we have all the different color rods. You can see all these rods that look like they're black. They're actually transparent colors, but they're so densely made that in rod form, it just looks like black. Now the colors, you can actually see the true colors. Those are our opaque colors. So you can actually see, you know, that really nice reds we use, really nice jade greens, purples, and they'll come out pretty much how you see them in the rods. However, these other guys, they're a little bit of a surprise. So we really need to know what we're gonna be making before we start. And it's really important to keep track of these because if you lose a label on one of these, you'll never know exactly what color it is. So I actually cut a chunk of 44, which you start to learn the numbering, and that's actually a silver blue. And then we have the 34, which actually is a silver green. These two little chunks here, you can see I sliced them up. You can see once they're cut, you have no idea what they are. We're gonna go ahead and put these into the annealing oven. So, uh, and this is our frit right here, our granular glass. These are the many colors that we have there. You've seen us use the frit on previous generate uh, projects there. And Josh has run around the corner to go drop those two pieces of color into an annealing oven. So fortunately, he's gonna use both of those pieces of color in the same piece. Otherwise, he wouldn't be able to tell them apart and he wouldn't know which one he was making first. Looking for a little copper ruby? Yeah, I look for a little bit of copper ruby. Okay, so having a bit of an advantage working here, I kind of know what he's heading for right now in a color combination. This is going to be a piece that uh, is from the Chalcedony series, right? That's it. Okay, so when he says silver blue and silver green, and then the copper ruby, all of these colors have silver as an ingredient and there are metal oxides involved which create your blues greens and your uh, reds which is the copper ruby and then when they all get mixed together there's a special thing that happens you want to tell them about that josh yeah so all colors are metals when they interact with each other they make actually new colors so as you start to work the glass you kind of learn what metals interact with each other. So those silver colors actually interact with the copper oxide that's in the copper ruby color. And when they mix, you get browns, purples, greens, blues, pretty much all the different colors. The more you mix them up, the more colors you get. So it's a lot of fun to make these colors. So I put those colors in the oven, and it usually takes about two minutes to heat up. I've been talking for about a minute. Take another minute to heat up, and then I'll pick up those colors. Cool. And uh, what kind of shape are you going to make today? Have you decided on the vessel? Yeah, we're just going to make a really nice flower vessel shape. It kind of has a narrow neck with kind of a bulbous bottom, holds a nice middle water, and it displays flowers well. Okay. So that's kind of our theme, displaying flowers. Okay, great. All righty. So Josh is now preheating the irons, and this is done so that the glass will stick to them. He's going to grab a little bit of uh, clear glass on the end of what we call a punty iron. It's one of our smaller irons. And he's going to use that in just a moment to pick up the three pieces of color out of the annealer. So he'll put that in there, and as he reaches in, he'll touch each of the three pieces of color. And if all goes according to plan, they'll all three come out on that iron. And, yep, he got it. Okay, so they're moving around a little bit. He's going to gradually introduce some heat into it. You noticed he hadn't put the piece, uh, pieces of glass all the way into the glory hole yet. Uh, he didn't have an extreme warm-up time on that, so he doesn't want to suddenly expose them to the 2300 degree heat. So by standing a little bit outside, or keeping the glass a little outside the opening, 
he gradually introduces the heat. And as the uh, next minute or two passes, he'll gradually push that further into the heat and begin melting the colors together. Now, I don't think you can see it on camera, but I can start to see the little chips are copper ruby red, and I can actually see that one piece actually going clear. The neat thing about this red is when it gets hot, it actually goes clear, so that's telling me it's starting to heat up. So I think I'm okay to go all the way in. What's that called, Bruce, when it goes clear? Striking. Right. Is this a quiz, or did you have a senior moment? That was a quiz. <laughs> Do you know what's going on in the striking process? Why don't you tell us? I actually don't know. <laughs> it's a chemical transformation, and I believe it has to do with crystallization. But I'm not absolutely certain on that. Yeah, but the glass it. crystals, as they heat up, uh, the nature of them changes. But let's take a look at what he's got right now. You can see the two darker pieces are the silver blue and the silver green. The brighter color is the copper ruby. And the copper ruby, as Josh said, strikes, which means uh, the process is to think of it as losing its color and then regaining it. And what happens is if you put the glass into extreme heat, and it's a striking glass, it's going to become more transparent looking. You won't see the same color that you saw when you picked it up. Now he's going back to pick up the other piece of copper ruby, I believe, that was missed on the first pickup. In fact, I believe what happened was the copper ruby broke, perhaps, yeah. The piece of copper ruby broke in the annealer, so he got two of the three chunks, and he just went back while things were heating up to pick up the third little piece of copper ruby. So back to this business of striking. As the glass heats up, as a striking glass, it, it begins to get a more transparent color, and then when you take it out and you let it cool, it does the striking process, which is, again, I believe has to do with the crystalline organization in the glass, and it changes and it becomes much darker. So the copper ruby is the color that strikes. Now he's got all three colors pretty well heated up, and he's able to turn them on the marver, and he's just mixing them up a little bit. Now because of the chemical reactions he's looking for and the fact that the copper ruby is, uh, I don't know the best way to describe it, but let's say it's the more active of the three. Yeah, I think that's good. It's, it's, that'll make uh, most of you happy with an explanation like that. It's a lesser proportion than the other two. So he's got about a two to one ratio of silver blue, silver green to copper ruby. And I, I if he overloaded it with copper ruby, it wouldn't make a good mix. And now you can see him turning the iron as he transfers to a blowpipe. He's turning the putty iron, it's twisting the glass up. The brighter stripes that you see are the copper ruby. The darker stripes that you see in that are the silver blue and the silver green. And at this point, Neither one of us can tell which is which. No, but they're it, not the same. So he'll, uh, he'll mix this up more. He'll do a lot of twisting with it, and then he'll also use a pair of tweezers to pick at the glass and kind of fold it back over itself. Probably got most of his uh, twisting done. He's gonna, he can grab it. Now you can see him pulling small bits straight out and up, and this is going to allow him to mix it even more. Now one of the things he wants to avoid with this process is trapping air bubbles underneath those little pieces that he pulled up. If they were to just fall over and loop against the main body of the glass, what would happen is they could trap little air bubbles. So by carefully heating and melting and shaping the glass, he avoids trapping any of the air bubbles. If he trapped air bubbles in that color chunk, he would wind up with gaps in the color in the finished piece. Well, Which good day it? from Orlando, Florida, Adams Artistry. Okay, and Bridget, 
So we got we've got a lot of explanation going on uh, early on. Didn't get a chance to acknowledge everybody checking in, but glad to have you all here with us. Okay, so now he uses tweezers again. Notice how he's pulling up and looping it over some. But again, if any of those pieces that are pulled up were able to just make a loop and hold air as they melt it in, those air traps would show up in the color. And every once in a while it happens and it actually looks like a gap in the color. And so we look at the piece and wonder, well, how did that gap get there? And usually it's a case of a little bit of space or an air bubble trapped in the color. So this is all by way of preparation. The reactions are taking place already between the silver blue, silver green, and the copper ruby. At this point, you don't really see any of the extra purples, but you'll start to see a little bit of brown and some shading going in. So a couple of, couple more markers and picks. Hey, one more pick and one more marker. We're okay, all righty. Now the copper ruby is still going to perform the same as it has, so it's striking nature being interspersed with the silver blue and the silver green is still going to continue to take place. But when it gets mixed in thoroughly with those colors, that's when we get the unusual and the unforeseen colors coming up. You really have no control over what colors pop up, do you, Josh? No, I mean, you can kind of see, like, you can see the copper ruby. So you can kind of mix that in with the blue and green, try to get those other colors, but that's about all you can do is, you know, kind of mix that red in with the blue and green. And what you get is what you get. There you go. So that's why when we make these pieces, they, as far as coloration, they truly are one of a kind. Now as far as the form the vessel takes, we can duplicate that from one iteration to another, but uh, the color, sometimes it just is what it is. Now that he's got the color satisfactorily mixed up and he's got it thoroughly heated throughout, he'll begin to shape that gather of glass and then he'll introduce a very tiny amount of air into it. He's using the wooden block. It's basically a wooden cup on a handle. It's cherry wood. Fruit woods make the best for this with their nice tight grain. You can see some steam rising. The wood is worked wet. In other words, it's not dried out before it's carved and it's kept in water for all its, all its life. Now he's blowing a little air in and you can see here the way the colors are mixing up and the bright spots you may see a little of, those are where the copper ruby's poking through. So it's intermixed and it's also visible. New paper. Yep. So you grab the piece of the newspaper. We use the newspaper for shaping and also for cooling portions of the glass and he'll be probably taking two full gathers on this piece. So right now he's taking a gather of clear glass from our furnace. He'll use his block again, or his newspaper, to shape the glass. What do you want? Yeah. Got it? All right. There we go. It's early. He, has, he hasn't made up his mind yet. Okay. So again, the block shapes the glass, gives it a nice, uniform, symmetrical shape. It also cools the outside a little bit, gives it a little bit of a stiffness or a skin on it so that it's not wobbling all over the place. When this is under control and just exactly where he wants it, you'll notice he's not just killing time now. He's letting the glass cool a little bit. He's watching the motion of the glass, and now after all that weight, here comes the air. Sometimes if we act too fast on the glass, and the glass is still a little bit too hot, it can take off on us. It's because we all know that hot glass moves. So by waiting a little bit, it gets a little more control and gets us to do exactly what he wants. You can see the colorations in there. 
It's a little hard with the brightness, the incandescence of the glass, but as the glass cools a little and what's toward the pipe, you can see the colors. He'll let that stabilize a moment and take his next gather. And again, this is going to be the same type of thing, a coating of the glass or collecting the glass onto the pipe. If he gets more than he wants, he'll drizzle some off. If that's just the right amount, he'll begin to work it. Now he's going to want a larger block. And he's going to catch the glass in the block. And you'll notice he keeps the pipe turning all the time. He has to do that or the glass will fall toward the floor. Every once in a while, he'll either dip the block in the bucket to wet it, or in this case, switch over to the newspaper. Seven or eight sheets of newsprint folded into about a seven inch by eight inch uh, pad and then thoroughly wet is a perfect insulator. It allows him to grip the glass and it's basically as if his hands are shaping it. You'll notice he changed the shape of it from a, a pear shape or perhaps round to a little bit elongated. Uh, I'd say like a football shape, but I'd have to specify American football because we have some visitors from the UK with us. And we wouldn't want you to confuse this with what we call a soccer ball. But by elongating it a little bit, he's changing the ratio of the diameter to the length. It also cools the glass. Uh, no, it's not too hot on his hands. If it was really hot on his hands, he wouldn't be doing it. Um, the, the newspaper's a perfect insulator. Where heat would be, would be up on his arm, which is exposed to the radiant heat. Good morning, Barbara Belzer. Okay, he's using the jacks now, a pair of metal blades hinged together to create a constriction, or what we conveniently call a jack line, or a neck line. This is the point where the piece will be separated from the, the blowpipe later on. Generally, we make the lower half to two-thirds of a vessel first, then we transfer it to another pipe and finish the top. And that's why we can call that constriction a neckline, because that's going to be the neck of the vase. Notice the angle he held the pipe as he was at the metal table, the marver. That cooled that area and formed it into a bit of a cone, and when it cooled it, it ensured that his inflation would take place above that point and not blow it too thin. So now he's got the vessel elongated. He did cool the tip a little bit. If he wants to lengthen this anymore, he'll simply use gravity to do it. And he's doing it gradually. See the slight angle and in a very gentle swing. He's not spinning it around excessively. It's very hot when it comes out of the glory hole, so he gives it a moment to relax. A little more blowing. You can see the diameter at the bottom increase. And then he'll sit and probably cut the jack line in a little more distinctly. The size and the shape of that jack line helps determine the success of the transfer. If it's not cut tight enough, the piece can shatter on the transfer. And if it's not shaped fairly well, it can also shatter on the transfer. So he's cut that neckline down to a very much smaller diameter than the rest of the glass. Todd is now going to bring in what we call a cheater or a security bit, if you will. He's going to bring a little bit of glass over on an iron, and Josh will peel off just a little bit of it onto the very center of the bottom of the piece. This will be a point for the punty to attach. If you haven't viewed the videos before, we'll explain punty in a minute. Josh is holding the bottom shape now. Todd brings him the little bit of glass using the tweezers. Josh grips it centers it and lets it trail off. The glass is burning itself away. Now he's going to flatten that disc and work on flattening the bottom of the piece. He can use the back of the jacks or a paddle. 
This will be a great spot for the punty or pontal to attach, and that's what Todd's going to prepare right now. With a very small amount of glass on the end of another iron, he will shape this and it will form a bit of a glue bit, if you like. And this glue joint will adhere to the disc that Josh just peeled off on the bottom. And then when Josh breaks the neck of the vessel free, it'll be stuck to the punty. And what the bit on the bottom there does is ensure that when we remove the piece from the punty, it doesn't break. It's possible for the punty to be warm enough that it more or less welds to the bottom of the piece sometimes. And if you require a little extra force to take it off, well, then you can take the bottom out of the vessel. Josh will line that up with the central axis of the piece. He'll use his tweezers to keep it centered. And now he'll just keep an eye on it for a moment. It needs to settle down again. We're just letting a little bit of heat dissipate. If we do this too soon, it'll wobble all over the place on Todd's iron. A couple of drops of water at the neck, a tap of the pipe, and it comes free and you can still see that it's moving, but not really drastically. Todd brings it over and begins to heat the upper portions of the vessel. That punty joint is still very hot, so if he were to stop turning, the piece would fall off center, and that wouldn't be good, because Josh would have to recenter it. So now what you do is we work the top half of the vessel. So the bottom two-thirds of this are done. As Josh described, the piece will have a bulbous bottom, which it's already got, and then a nice taper coming up to a narrow opening. And that's what he's working on now. Where the jack line was separated from the blowpipe, was cold enough to be fractured and taken away, it now has to be reheated so that it's malleable and he can work it. So in a moment, after he's happy with the heat in it, he'll bring it back to the bench and begin to work on that. If the lip needs a little flattening or straightening, he'll take care of that with the back of the jacks, or he may use the jack blades to go directly into it, make sure it's spherical, and then work on the rest of the process. When he slides the glass in for just a moment, we call that a flash heat to keep it all warm. You can see where the heat is in this. It's the orange part. There's the flattening of the lip with the strap or hinge of the jacks. And then by using the jacks and changing the angle, notice as his hand comes up, the glass on the lip flares. That upward angle is pushing the glass. Now you can see the colors coming in the bottom two thirds of the vessel. And there's the mixture. They're more than simply Cope, copper, ruby, blue, and green. They're much more complex because of the chemical reaction. He's heating the lip mainly, but every few seconds he flashes the rest of the piece. If the piece drops below 1,000 or 1,100 degrees Fahrenheit, it could crack. So we have to well, hello, Wayne Hillman from Allentown. Thank you, Lynn Bear. We appreciate your comments. And Joanna, wonderful. Okay, so here we are back to the glass. Again, you can see the heat. It's out there where it's bright orange. Josh uses the jack blades to keep it centered and round. And if he wants a little more flare, he raises his arm and the jack angle. And this creates more flare in the lip of the vessel. And Todd was shielding his forearm with a wooden paddle. So somebody asked earlier about his hand getting hot when using the paper. Let's get a good look at this. And there's your wonderful color pattern. You can see some purples in there, some browns. When it comes out of the annealer, it'll be even more impressive. Todd's putting on a pair of insulated gloves right now. He will catch the piece as Josh breaks it off and put it in the annealer for slow cooling. If we put this vase on the floor right now and waited in about a half hour, it would shatter into many pieces. So what Josh will do right now is put a little bit of water on the punty joint 
right up against that little button or cheater that he put on. A tap of the pipe, it comes off in Todd's gloved hand and goes into the annealer. The annealing process will take about eight hours for that and that's when we'll be able to take it out. So, Barbara Belzer says she has another decision to make. The vase from last week or this one? So let's, uh, let's hear it for Josh. Yeah, okay, great. All right, thank you guys and thank you, Todd. And uh, if you're folks that have been joining us on the last few weeks, you know that we do this little 30 minute teaser on YouTube and then go to a approximately two hour show on uh, Facebook Live. So if you're so inclined, please join us over in Facebook Live and uh, we'll be there in just a couple minutes. Yeah. Have a great day. Yeah, thanks, folks.